Okay. And uh, there were a few topics that came up yesterday that um, I believe I sent Chris some links who um, then I guess sent it out to everyone. So you should have had an email about that. And what I'll do is I'll share my screen and go over um, what I found. Um, unfortunately, I um, what I found is I, I don't have any better answers than I had um, yesterday. Uh, now, one of the good things, um, one of the one of the things that that I was actually incorrect about yesterday was um, being able to convert the classic quiz to a new quiz. I actually didn't think that worked, um, but there is a button as we saw yesterday that you could do that. But the bad news is that if you use question banks, which are pools in Blackboard, if you have question banks like I do, when you convert it to the new quiz, um, those question banks do not get carried over into the item bank which is question banks for the new quiz. Um, one of the things I realized yesterday was that if, when I created the quiz, if I created the group first, and then I used the find questions to add the question bank to the group, when I converted it to the new quiz, at least I was able to see the questions. But when I, um, um, I'm sorry, when I did the find questions and then created the group with the question bank, right? Then, I, but if I created the group first and then added the questions after, when I went to the new quiz, those questions weren't there. Um, so the first link that you may see is I found this on the Canvas community. It's just sort of confirming that. So this person says that um, uh, to create a classic quiz with all the questions and then get all the questions into an export uh, to the new quiz, you must use the find questions, right? So you hit the find questions button first, then go to the question bank, select your questions, then create the um, question group there, okay? And then if you do the convert to the new quiz, uh, the questions will carry over. If you create the group first and then add in the question bank and then convert it, then it's not there. We saw that yesterday and I still have it. So let me bring it up. So here's my quizzes and here's my quiz one. Okay, so, oh, I actually had, I think I deleted it because it wouldn't let me take the quiz if I still had it in there, right? So this is, the, so I only have the one left here that I actually, what I did was I found the questions and when I selected the questions, I said, go ahead and create the group from there. And then when I converted it over, it was fine. Now, the only problem with this is um, I can actually preview it and I can give this to students and they will see the question just fine, okay? Like we see here, but the problem is that um, if I go into my item banks, um, it did not create an item bank from that question bank. So yeah, the questions are there in the quiz and that's good, but what if I wanted to create a new quiz or if I wanted to take that item bank and put it on a midterm or something, well, I, I still don't have the item bank. So the second link that Chris sent is a way that you could um, um, move the question bank questions to item bank questions. It's, it's a very manual solution. This is not an easy, uh, unfortunately, quick fix. Um, what they basically say to do is to create a classic quiz, add all the questions from your question bank, convert it to a new quiz. And then when you go into the new quiz, you'll see all your questions there. Okay. So let me show you here.
Okay, so let's say I created a quiz and I added all my questions. They wouldn't appear in a group. They, you would just basically add them all, all to, you know, all put them all in your quiz as a separate question, right? So then what happens is if you go to edit the question, okay, there is a section called item banking at the bottom and you say add to bank and then you have to add each question to your question to your item bank. So it could take a long time if you have a lot of question banks with a lot of questions. So, you know, this is just a way to get it from, you know, from question bank to item bank. But again, unfortunately, it's not a very easy or quick way of doing it. Um, but it was the best solution that that uh, I was able to, to find in my search. So that's what this shows you how to do. Um, I think for me, I'm just going to go ahead and continue using the classic quiz. Um, the only downside that I have about the class is actually two. One is with the essay solutions, I cannot post them without the students seeing them. So I'm just gonna have to keep them on a separate Word document or something and refer to them as I grade. And the second issue that I have is um, if you have student accommodations, you will have to set those accommodations for each quiz. Whereas with the new quizzes, they claim, I haven't tried it, but they claim you just have to set it up once and that setting should carry over from quiz to quiz. I'll show you how to do that too. Um, but anyway, so that's how you would do that if you do work with question banks. The third link I sent was a question that somebody asked about bonus assignments. So, um, yeah, Chris yesterday had a good solution. He said, just create an assignment. And um, if they don't answer it, it won't affect their grade. And if they do answer it, you can give them those extra points. And that's fine as long as you don't have the grade book to automatically give zeros if they don't submit an assignment. If you have that, then, then that solution may not work as well. Uh, this is another solution here. This is the third link in your email. Um, what they do say to do is make an assignment worth zero points. If you make an assignment worth zero points and the zero does and, and the student doesn't do it, they'll still get full credit for it, but it won't actually impact their grade book in any way. And then the students that did do it, you could go in and grade and give them those extra points. So um, again, this is that solution for the bonus um, assignment that someone asked about. I think, it, um, I think it may have been Kevin that asked that. Okay. Okay. What do I go and see here today? Okay. So, um, so that's it. Now, some things I missed yesterday. One of the things I missed was to uh, set up the accommodations. So let me show you how to do that. And the first way I'll show you how to do it in a classic quiz. Okay, so for the classic quiz, which is my first one here. So if I had a student that um, had some an accommodation that needed extra time, what you would have to do is first go to the quizzes page. Okay, and like I said, unfortunately, you do have to do this for each individual quiz. You click on the quiz that they need extra time for. Okay. And then you'll see the this quiz summary come up. And on the right-hand side, there's a button that says moderate this quiz. Okay, and you click on moderate this quiz. Now, this does need to be published before this appears on the right side. If it's an unpublished quiz, you'll see that goes away. Okay, so you do need to publish it first. And then moderate this quiz comes up and you click on that, okay? And then you choose the student, and I'll choose test student here, that um, that needs the extra time, okay? And you click on the uh, edit button here on the right, the pencil icon, okay? Now, I actually didn't set up any time, so I need to do that first. If you don't set up a timer for everybody, then you can't give extra time to a student. So I'm sorry, so let me go back and do that. Okay, so let me edit my quiz and I'm gonna set a time limit of 15 minutes. 
Okay, and now I'm going to go back to moderate this quiz. And I'll click on test student. Actually, I don't even think you have to click on it. I think you just need to hit that um, edit button. And now here are the extension options. So you could do extra attempts, um, but the most common extension, of course, is the time. So if this person, let's say, has a 100% extra time, you just set it to 100 minutes. And that's it. And you click Save. And now this person gets 100 minutes extra on each attempt. Okay, and that's really um, all there is to it. Okay, now if you're using a classic quiz, so for the classic quiz, um, what you need to do is you have to click on the build button. And in the build button, you'll see there's some tabs up here. There's settings, there's reports, there's moderates. And you could play around with these if you're interested in the new quiz. This is where all those settings are that we don't see when we actually build the quiz in the new quiz. So you could turn on shuffle answers, shuffle questions, and things like that. Um, and then there's a moderate tab. Okay, And here in the moderate tab is where you're going to um, Oh, I don't have a test student here. Okay, so that's interesting. The new quiz doesn't show the test student. I'm not seeing it. Okay, so I'm just going to click on the first student here just randomly. And here you can put additional attempts and time adjustments. So you can say set extra time and then give however much time you want. Now, theoretically, this should carry over to your next quiz. If you create another new quiz, it's supposed to keep these settings. Yeah, I haven't tried it, but that's what they claim. Okay. So then this way, every time you build a quiz, you won't necessarily have to go and change the time for that particular student uh, like you have to do with the classic quizzes. Okay. So that's, that's it there. Okay, for the quizzes. Um, so if there's no other questions, what I'll do then is jump into how to integrate with your third party platform. Now I use Cengage and unfortunately, oops, I typed that in wrong. Cengage made a lot of changes over the summer with their interface. So if you use Cengage, uh, now, I, I don't know if this is only Cengage MindTap or this is all of Cengage. And, and I know, Will, you mentioned you use the WebAssign platform. So I'm not sure if this applies to WebAssign. But if you log into Cengage um, and if you use MindTap, you'll see they have a totally new interface. Okay. And they changed a lot of things. So if you click on my courses, you'll see all your courses and they're actually grouped differently than they used to be. Um, in the old interface, they used to be grouped by product and now all the courses show as a separate course. And um, when you create a course in MindTap, um, they used to have the concept of the master course. So you would create a master course and then you can create section courses off of that master. And it looks like they've done away with that. So for example, I created a master course here. And when I created the master course, they went ahead and created a section course automatically. And when I built, uh, I actually jumped a little bit ahead to do spring 2022 to see how this affected things. And you can see it created a totally new spring 2022 course. It didn't actually put it under the master like it used to. So this kind of screws up a little bit the integration on the Canvas side. Um, another thing is we, in the old interface, you used to be able to delete a course and now they don't have that option anymore. Um, but I did reach out to Mind, uh, Cengage about this and they are going to add it. In the meantime, if you need to delete a course, you can just go back to the classic view um, and do everything you used to be able to do, but that expires in October. So they did say that you will have all the same functionality in this interface when that does expire. Um, 
But anyway, so as I build, as I integrate now from Canvas, I'm going to try something a little bit different because what I did initially is when I created my MindTap, I, what I like to do is create the MindTap course from a master from within Canvas and then integrate that new course. And what happened was in the master, I went ahead and um, only put in those assignments um, that I that I wanted from those units, right? So you can see I don't cover unit seven and eight. Okay, so now whenever I create my sections, I wanted to use this. And then when I created my section, which I did for the spring of 2022, and I linked it to Canvas, even though I created it from that master course, it basically gave me a totally new mind tap. So I have every unit in here. It's as if I created this from scratch without copying the course at all. So um, I'm going to do that again here today. I'm going to try something a little bit different to see if it works. And if it doesn't, if you use MindTap, I'll show you some um, other ways you can copy a course. But, um, but maybe you don't use MindTap. Maybe you use MyLab um, from Pearson. Maybe use McGraw-Hill. Whatever the case is, if you go into your navigation settings within Canvas, uh, in the bottom list, remember this is the list that does not show to students. It has all of the platforms that you need or, or that, that, that you may need. If there's a platform that's not here um, that you may use, reach out to either IT or another thing you can do is maybe search in the apps tab the, because that's really what these are. These are apps. And you may be able to find your publisher if they have a Canvas app within this library. Okay, so this app is, and I'm gonna show you how to, I'm gonna actually install an app a little later today, um, but these are just um, apps that can be written that to integrate with Canvas. And there's so many out there. And, and again, um, a lot of these are publishers that have smart books or eBooks that you can bring in, right? So oops, there was just McGraw-Hill over here. Right. Um, but again, th these are essentially those apps. So if they're not in this list, you can still possibly find that publisher in that app library. So I use Cengage. So I'm going to click and drag Cengage and put it up here. OK. Now, this is one of those items that even though it says that these are the ones that are hidden from students, there are still some up here that get hidden from students. So for example, students will never be able to see my Cengage link. They won't see the item bank link. Um, they will not see the lockdown browser link. So not all of these links are necessarily shown to students. It all depends how that particular link works. Okay, so I'm gonna save this. Okay, so now that I save that, I have Cengage that shows up here in my navigation menu. Okay, and now I can click on Cengage. Okay, and Cengage allows you to add a homework platform, or if let's say you just want to use the ebook and you're not interested in the assignments in that platform, you could just add the ebook too. Um, but since I do use the assignments, I'm going to add the homework platform. Then it shows all the list of textbooks that are linked that are um, integrated with Canvas. And if you don't, if you use Cengage, and if you don't see your textbook here reach out to Cengage. They are the ones that add it to our Canvas. Um, I don't know how they do it, but they're the ones that do it. It's not IT. Okay, so reach out to your Cengage representative and say, I'm using this book in my class. Can you please add it to Canvas so I can go in and link to it? Okay. Um, if I remember when I, and I used to have to do this with Blackboard too. Uh, Pearson is a little bit different. When I use Pearson, I think edit, you could just use any book in their library and, and link it. You didn't have to have them add it, but Cengage is a little different. Okay, so the book that I'm going to use for this class is this one right here, MindTab 2.0 for Lambert's Fundamentals of Python. And I click link to course. Okay, and these are the different options that I get. So I can create a whole new course. Um, I can copy an existing course. I can copy from a course key or I can link to an existing course. So um, 
this is my existing course here. It's called Master. And it does have a course key. So this is what I would use if I wanted to copy from a course key or if I wanted to copy from an existing course. The problem with that, though, if I chose that option, is it would then make the master course the one that's linked to my campus. And I don't want that. I want the master course to be a course that students don't see and that every semester I can just use to build my new course. So what I'm going to do is say copy an existing course. OK. Now, if I didn't have a master, if I didn't have anything in, in MindTap at all, then I would choose the first one, copy it, uh, create a new course, and it would just create a whole mind tap um, from scratch. But since I do have a master, I'm going to copy from the existing course. And this is what gets confusing. It shows me two masters, even though I have only one. So I think what's happening is this is probably the first one, and this one's the second one. And when I created my spring 2022, I chose the first one. So I'm thinking that this is maybe the um, mind tap with all of the um, assignments in it. And this is my mind tap that I, that I um, modified. So what I'm gonna do this time is I'm gonna choose the second one and hopefully it works. And I'm going to call it BSAN 300 all 2021. And then I'll put in the start date. Um, now, a lot of these platforms, by the way, give free trials. And um, the free trial is usually a week or two. Uh, one thing that I realized is when you use Pearson, when it asks for a start date, um, I used to have to put in the like today's date, because if I didn't, I wouldn't even be able to get into the course until it started. And then, but then whenever the students went into the course, as soon as they registered, they had a free week of trial starting from that day. MindTap's a little different. With MindTap, you can get into the course no matter what day you start it, but the students won't be able, but the students get their, their trial starting on that day. So for this, I'm gonna choose August 19th because that's when the semester starts. And whether a student registers or not on August 19th, that's when their free trial is going to begin. So, um, but, you know, so depending on the platform you use, this start date can be a little bit tricky. Okay, but I'm going to use, because I'm using uh, Cengage, I'll use the start date of the semester. And the end date, I usually just make the end date the last day of the year, December 31st, 2021. Okay, and choose your time zone. That's good. Okay, now I'm going to hit continue. Uh, this is gradebook settings. This, again, may be just specific to MindTap or Cengage. You can always change this after the fact, but if you are inter if you're integrating the grade, if you're using the gradebook in Canvas like I am, and you just want to bring in the grades from MindTap and add them to your gradebook in Canvas, you choose the first option. If you're only using MindTap, if you say, you know what, I like the gradebook in MindTap, all my assignments are in MindTap, Canvas is just a gateway to get to the MindTap course. Then you can just add overall scores. Okay. But since I have some assignments in Canvas and some in MindTap and they share a great book, I'm going to choose the first one. Okay. Hit continue. It will finalize the course. Okay. The import is completed. Okay. Just takes me back to my home page. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into here. And I'm going to refresh to see if my course is here. And here's my fall 2021. Okay, now here's the moment of truth. I'm going to see if it did it did the course from scratch or if it actually did create a copy like I said to do. Okay, so it actually created the copy. This is good. So now it looks just like my master course. So the only thing you need to be careful about, if you do set up courses the way I do using Cengage, is, um, let's see, I have the screenshot here. And maybe they'll fix this, hopefully they will, because I did email them about it. Um, 
if you have, if you create a master like me, and then you created your course from that master, choose the second radio button, not the first. Because when I chose the first, it gave me a, uh, a course from scratch. So when I just checked the second one, um, it gave me the copy of the one that I had, had wanted to copy. Okay, so that's the trick there. Okay, good. So here it is. So now my um, Cengage course is linked. And now what I can do is import the assignments that I'd like them to do, okay? So if I go back to my modules page, um, again, the in-class assignments I use in Canvas, the quizzes are also from Canvas, but my objectives, my readings, and my homework, I, all pull, I always pull in from MindTap. So what we need to do now is go back to Cengage. So I click, click Cengage on the left. Here is my book. And by the way, if you use Cengage, one of the nice things about Cengage is you can pull in other homework platforms too. So if you have another book that has an assignment that you like to use, you could go ahead and, and link that one also. Uh, I do not believe uh, Pearson has that ability. With Pearson, you can only link to one book. But with Cengage, you can link to as many as you'd like. You only have to remember, though, that if you do link to multiple books in, your, in Cengage, uh, the students need to purchase the Cengage Unlimited package, um, which is $120. If they buy the book only, they won't be able to access other books. But if they buy Cengage Unlimited, they can get um, access to any, anything that you put in there. So that's a really nice feature of, of Cengage. OK, so now when I click in Cengage, um, I already have this is the only one I'm using for this class. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Select Content. And this is where I'm going to select the assignments that I want to bring in to, um, to, to Canvas. And I'm going to go ahead and start with Unit 1. OK. And this, by the way, is set up the exact same way as if I were to open it here. See, it has the same folders and everything. OK. And assignment 1.6 and 1.7, these are two assignments that I'd like to do for homework. These are graded assignments in my Cengage. Right, so I have some practice assignments. The practice ones are the ones I go over in class. And then I take uh, two of the larger assignments. I say, OK, these are the ones you have to do for homework. So that's why it says count towards grade. And because it counts toward the grade, I have that little link on the right-hand side that says uh, checkbox rather. It says add to grade book. So these will actually show up in my grade book when I import them. Um, I also like to give them the chapter of the book. Okay, so I give them the reading and I like to give them the preview also. So I'm gonna check those and I'm gonna hit continue. Okay, so the import is completed. And now, in actuality, it didn't really import anything, um, even though it calls it an import. All it did is really create links to those assignments um, in MindTap. So now the question is, well, where did those links go? Well, again, in, in Canvas, everything's a module, right? So all you need to do is go to your modules page. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, it created a module group. And I'm actually going to click and drag and move this up. And the module group is called Lambert's Fundamentals of Python. So, and it has all of those links, right, that I brought in. It even gave me a link to the course itself. So this link right here, I may actually want to keep this, right? Like maybe I'll put this in my week one. Or maybe what I'll do is, and I think I'm going to do this, I'm going to create a page that's going to say register with Cengage. And then on that page, maybe I'll copy this link. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and if I were to click on this, right, it will open up, well, it will bring me to this page first. And I click on this button and it will open up the uh, MindTap course. So the first day of class, I'm going to tell students, click on this link and they're going to go in, they're going to register and they'll get the free week, week trial or maybe they'll purchase it. Um, and that's the link that they'll use. Okay. Now these here are links to the actual assignments and the book. So the preview, I'm gonna take this and put this under my objectives, okay? 
the reading I'm going to take and put under the reading. And then these programming exercises, I want them to do these for homework. I'm going to put these under the homework. And these are already indented by default, so I don't have to indent them. Okay. Um, I don't need this group. Now, anytime that you do an import, it's always going to create a new module group. But once you're done copying everything over where you need it to, you can just delete it, just like you delete any module. Okay. And that's it. Now, when the students want to do the homework, they click in it. Now, all of the due dates um, and the, the date range when the assignment's open, you can do all of that in MindTap. So you don't have to worry about changing any settings in Canvas if it's a MindTap or you know, third-party um, uh, assignment. All right. So if you click on the actual assignment, it will open up Cengage and you know, it, what's really nice is the student sometimes doesn't even realize they're going into MindTap, right? Because it's just a button in Canvas that opens up their assignment. All right, so here's, here's what they would need to do. And they would complete this assignment. They would submit it. And then after they submit the assignment, then if you go into your grade book, you'll see the programming exercise here. See, here's programming exercise 1.6, here's programming exercise 1.7. Another thing you have to remember to do, this is important, and I forgot to do it, is go into your assignments link and make sure you do categorize them correctly. By default, it's gonna go into the first assignment group, which is in class, and that's wrong. This is a homework. So I need to move this down to homework. So don't forget to do that. Another thing to be very careful about, um, the one thing that works different in my than Canvas than in Blackboard. Okay, so notice that these assignments are 100 points each. That's the number of points that they give them by default in MindTap. I teach some courses where for some reason or another, they'll give two points for an assignment or they'll make it 10 points in MindTap. And what I do is in Blackboard, I used to use percentages. So when the students submitted an assignment, let's say they get a two out of two on that particular assignment, they got two out of two points, it would show up as 100% in my grade book. And then when I did the averages, it would also go in as 100%, right? Or if, I, if they got a one out of two, it'd be 50% and their average would be 50% would be factored into the average. I realized during the summer that in Canvas, even though you can tell the grade book to show it as a percentage, the averages in the grade book still calculate using the points. Okay, so be very careful about that. So if you use a third party um, platform that use their, their own point system, but you like to make it an even 100% or 100 points in Canvas, change it to 100 points in the platform you're using, okay? Do not convert it in Canvas because even if you convert it to a percentage, Canvas will still use, because I was what I was noticing is uh, the, the, for instance, the homework averages didn't look right, right? I had students that would miss homework, but their averages weren't as low as I expected them to be because the homeworks that they were missing may have only been two points where they were doing other homeworks that were 10 points. Um, so thankfully I saw that and, and I was able to adjust it, um, you know, before I, I submitted those grades. Um, so then I realized, okay, I better go ahead and make everything a hundred points in MindTap. So when they come over, there'll be a hundred points and everything will be exactly the way my grade book is set up in Canvas. Okay, so that was one thing that Blackboard did better than Canvas, okay. All right, so, um, so that's it. So that's how you would um, create the uh, um, course in your third party tool and import the assignments. And again, I used MindTap, so Pearson may be a little bit different. McGraw-Hill may be a little different because again, they all write their own apps to work with, with, um, uh, with Canvas. 
but the concept should be the same. Okay. And they should all have the feature too, right? Select the assignments, put them in your modules if you want to, and then be able to see them in your grade book. Okay. So any questions there? Okay. Let me go ahead real quick and I'm gonna create a new page and I'm gonna create that page for Cengage that I was talking about, right? So I'm gonna go back to what I, we looked at on Monday and I'm gonna to go to my pages screen and I'm gonna to go to view all pages and I'm gonna add a new page. And I already put this together in Notepad before this. So let me find that. Okay, so here's my mind tap. So I'm gonna take this here Okay, and I'm just going to title this mind tap. So I put the e-text as well as the in-class and homework assignments are available through the mind tap learning platform. You may register and access the mind tap using the link below. And I just wrote mind tap here. I'm going to make this a link. And then I say direct links to the e-text and assignments are also available through the course modules. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to put that mind tap link that goes to the course right here in this page. So the first thing I need to do is actually find out what that URL is. Okay, so I'm gonna save this page for now. I'm gonna go back to my modules page and here's the link that opens up that MindTap um, course. So I'm gonna right click on it, okay? And I'm gonna say copy link. This is how you can copy any link, any external link in Canvas. And this worked the same way with Blackboard, right? You just right click on it, you say copy link, okay? Now I'm gonna go back to my pages. I'm gonna to go to view all pages. I'm gonna edit my MindTap page. Oops, actually you have to click on it to edit, I'm sorry. Okay, now I'm gonna click the edit button here. I'm going to highlight this mind tap. I'm going to click the link um, button. And for the link, I'm going to do control V, which is going to copy the link to the mind tap course. I'm going to say done. I'm going to say save. And now I have this page that the students will see it's called mind tap. It's going to say the e-text as well as in class, right? And click the link below to get to it. They'll click it. They'll click this button and it will open mind tap. Okay. So this may be a little easier for them to understand rather than just have a link right to the mind tap here. I'm going to add that page now. Put that up here, I'll do an indent. Okay. And actually I want to change this. I'm gonna say register, register with MindTap, right? It's almost like a, um, an action item that they'll need to do that week one. And I'm publishing this. Now, um, I, you know, I want to say that this will need to be published for them to be able to use that link. Let me make sure. So I'm going to go into my student view. Oh, I never published week one. Okay, let me leave student view. Let me publish week one. But let's say I don't want to show this. You have to be a little careful because um, sometimes you do have to have the link published too for it to work. Okay, so let's see, register with MindTap. Okay, 
So if you don't publish the link, it's going to say this, not yet available. Okay, so it looks like you will need to publish the link for the link to work. All right, so I'm going to publish it. Um, but just to make it a little less confusing, I'm going to indent it under my register with mind tap. You can even do a couple indents if you want to. Okay, so then they'll see it like this. Okay, so they'll have register with mind tap and they can click on this link directly or if they click on the page, they'll get this and then click here. There we go. Okay, and that's it. All right, I'd like to show you now how to use apps because you may be thinking, you know what, I don't, I don't really like this format, um, kind of just throwing things in modules. Maybe things will get lost here. And I would rather have a link on the left-hand side for the students to see. Um, maybe have a mind tap link because that's what I used to do on Blackboard. All my links were on the left-hand side. So I'd have a mind tap link on the left and they'd click it and then that would bring up the content page that would say register with mind tap. But unfortunately by default at Canvas does not allow you to put those links here. So I'm going to show you how you can do it. Okay. And you can only do it through apps. So if you click on settings again, And if you click on apps, okay, there is an app called redirect. And if you type in redirect, it comes up here. And it says this add links to external web resources that show up as navigation items in the course. That means with the redirect tool, you can actually put a navigation item here on the left. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on that and we're gonna say add app. Okay. Now, this name is what's going to show up here on the left. So for example, I'm going to put in here MindTap. The URL redirect is the page it's going to redirect to. Okay. And um, oh, we also have to show in course navigation. So make sure you click on that. Okay. Now, um, I actually want this to open up that page that I just created and I don't know the URL for it yet. So I'm just gonna say add app for now and then I'll go back in and edit it. So I'm click add app. Okay, now when you hit add app and you go to your navigation, it's going to show up, where is it? Oh, maybe you need to put the URL because I don't see it. It should show up here. Um, but it didn't. Let me save or do a refresh. Here it is. I had to just do a refresh. I just did a save. Okay. So here it is. Mind tap. Okay. And, uh, it, it looks like it did automatically put it in the list of links that the students will see, but now when they click on the mind tap link, since I don't have a URL, it says URL is not provided. So now the question is, okay, I wanted to open up that page that I just made from my tap. So if I go back to my pages, I say view all pages. And I'm going to right click on this link. And I'm going to say copy link. Okay, or what you can do is you can click on it. And just grab the URL from your address bar up here, you can do that too. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to my settings. I'm going to click on the three dots and oh, how do I? Hmm. Oh, I thought I could edit it this way. It doesn't allow me to. Let me move it down here. Oh, it's not letting me edit it. I know you can. Uh, um, Okay, let me go to my installed. 
redirect tool view no oh i can't remember now how to edit it uh you'd have to add a new one for every link that you create but the question is how do i edit the the one that i have here it is okay so i clicked on Okay, not very intuitive. So I went to app. Okay, so that was the app center. So if I go to view app configurations, okay, here's my mind tap link. Click on here, edit. Here we go. Okay. And whoops. Okay, there's my launch URL. Submit. Okay, let me see if that works now. Student view. Okay, now they see mind tap on the left, they click it. Oh no, that didn't work. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to, I'm gonna delete that and then just do it again. So let me go to my app configurations, find tap delete, delete that. Okay. Let me refresh to make sure this appears. Okay, so it's gone. All right, so I'm gonna do one more time. I'm gonna go to view app center. I'm gonna do redirect. Here it is. Add app. I'm gonna do mind tap. And since I already have the URL, I'm going to paste it here. Showing course navigation, add app. Okay. Go to my navigation here. And it's not here yet. I have to save. Okay, there it is. So let me now go to home, student view, mind tap. There it is. So it's this now acts like a if if you use the content pages in Blackboard, which that's the way Blackboard works. And if you wanted Canvas to work that way, you can do that. And you could do mine, you know, put any link you want here. Create the page first. Okay, get the page URL, and then go to the App Center, install the redirect, and during the install, you do have to have that URL handy. Put whatever caption you want, link it to that URL, make sure you have it, add it to the navigation and it will be here, okay? So if you like using the navigation menu and giving links to your students from there, as opposed to modules, this is one, this is a way you can do that. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. So that's basically how I would set up my course. Um, I don't have the slides here, but again, if you wanted to add slides, uh, if you have PDF uh, slides that you want, I'm not PDF or um, PowerPoint, uh, you can go into your um, files and you can upload it there, or if you want, you can just do this, hit the add button for your module, and I'm gonna add a file, okay? And I'm gonna say create files from here, choose files, and I'll go into my courses, vSAN 300, and this is a programming class, so I really don't have many slides. I only show chapter one, kind of an introduction. Um, but you select that file. And I'm going to indent here one level. Add item. Okay. Here's my slides. I'm going to bring these up here. And there it is. Okay. And again, I could have went straight to files. Um, I didn't. 
Uh, but if I did, you know, you, you could add the file here too using the upload button. But even if you do it through the module, it will go ahead and add it here anyway. Okay, question. Uh, is it possible to change the view of the links? I would like to use pictures or shapes rather than blue underline if possible. Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't think so. Um, not with the redirect tool anyway. The redirect tool only lets you um, put in text. So it becomes a text on the left-hand side. Um, there may be another app that could do that, but um, yeah, unfortunately I'm not familiar with any that will do that. One of the things you could do, um, it doesn't help you with the links, Renee, but you can get very creative with your um, course in terms of pictures. So like on the dashboard, um, you'll notice I put some pictures of the beach here. I did that for my summer classes. I figured the students can at least see the beach when they come to my class uh, this way. Uh, by default, you're not going to have any pictures on it. But if if you go into your into your course and go into the course settings, um, and go to course details, you can put an image here, and you can say choose image. And what I like about this is you can, if you click on the unsplash um, tab. You can actually like, for instance, I may have searched beach, I don't remember, but whatever you search, you can actually use that picture for your class. Uh, so I know it doesn't, uh, okay, take care, Will. I know that doesn't help with the links, but at least it's one way you can bring in a picture. And, and I believe you can also use these in your, um, in your pages. So if you wanted to put a, a picture on your page, so when they click the link, you know, maybe you may not have a picture on the link, but when they go to the page, you know, you may want to show up a picture there. Um, you can do that. Right. So you can, for instance, say, I want to add an image and you can say, um, course images. And let's see, okay, so this is course files, but I think they allow you to do it here too. Maybe not. Oh, maybe you can, I thought you could. This may be a better question for IT. They may be able to show. Um, yeah, I guess not. But I think there is a way. Um, that you can add pictures from, from that library here, but I'd have to look into that. But Ben Brown, I, I think can demonstrate that if there is a way he would know. So, okay. Um, but that's basically it. I mean, this is how I would set up my course. Uh, so I have my modules, I have all my links now. And again, I have some assignments from Canvas. I have some quizzes. I have files, and I have um, I have links to uh, MindTap. Now, another thing you could add if you wanted to is um, discussions. And I'm not going to use discussions because I'm teaching on campus. But discussions may be good if you have an online class, particularly if you have a um, if you have a um, asynchronous course, right? Where maybe you're not holding lectures um, or you have recorded lectures that you post and maybe you wanna have a discussion board where you can interact with your students because you're not interacting with them through Zoom or, or through some other um, collaboration tool. So what I'm gonna show you is how you can um, add a discussion. Now, of course you can do it right from here if you wanted to create a topic um, but another way is to go to the discussions link on the left hand side. And if you click on the discussion link, you just say add discussion. And this is in my guide. I do step through this in my guide that I sent you. And you would add a topic title. So discussion topic. And no, I spelled that wrong. Discussion. Okay. And then you just put whatever you want to discuss. Please discuss this. This topic. Okay. And you can post it to now you do have course sections. 
Um, so if you have more than one section, it, it will show up here. You can post to all sections. So if you have three sections of a course, let's say you're teaching of the same course and you don't wanna have to post a discussion in each individual one, you could just say all sections. I only have one section. So um, just by saying all sections is gonna choose that one section. Um, you could put a file here if you want them to download a file, uh, attach it to your discussion. And then there are some options. You can allow threaded replies. Um, everyone can reply one time to a post, but if you wanted a threaded reply, meaning infinite levels of replies, you'd want to check that allow threaded replies. Okay. Uh, for images, can you use insert key? It will, oh, okay, you can use insert key. It will allow you to choose the a media image. Okay, let me try that. Okay, so what you're saying, Gail, is if you say for media here, course media. Uh, insert key it will allow you to choose media image. I went to the um, to the insert key at the top where it says edit view insert. I selected that one. Insert image. And then, um, well, I guess you could use image there. Upload image. Right. Okay. Oh, here it is. Thank you. Yeah. Unsplash. Thanks. Okay. There it is. And now you could put in. So if you wanted to, you know find a beach image or what have you. Yep, excellent, thank you. I knew it was there somewhere. Um, okay, okay. Um, user must, oh, this is nice. Users must post before seeing replies. This means like if you have a question and you don't want like the users to maybe copy what somebody else already put, check that checkbox. And that basically means that they will have to actually um, um, put, post something before they can see everybody else's. Enable podcast feed. I don't know too much about this one. Um, all I was able to really see is if you post a media file, like an audio file, you can subscribe to the thread like you would a podcast. So you can use something like iTunes, subscribe to this podcast. I guess they give you a URL that you can plug into iTunes and you can actually hear the media in, uh, files as you would any podcast um, audio file that may have been uploaded. So pretty neat feature. I don't really have a need for this, but maybe you would in your class. You can make these graded too. Um, so if you want to grade a discussion, you can do that. You can allow liking. The liking basically gives the thumbs up icon like on Facebook. So students can like a post that another student put. And then you can also add it to the student to do. The student to do again is the list that they see on their dashboard. So as soon as they log into Canvas as a to-do list on the right-hand side. So this which is added to that to-do list to say, post to the, to, the, to the discussion board. You can make it a group discussion too. To make it a group discussion, you do have to have student groups. You can make a student group through the groups link, which I don't have here on the left. I'll have to add that. Um, so I could show you how to do that. Actually, I think it's under people. Under people, you can create student groups. And I'll just demonstrate that in a minute. Um, but you can also, just like a lot of things in Canvas, you can go ahead and create the group right from here. So you can create the group and you can allow self sign up. So you can have like group one through four and tell your students go sign up for a group and they can sign up for groups that their friends are in if they want. Um, or you don't have to have self sign up and you can assign them to the groups. Um, and when you create your group, you can also split it up into, let's say you want four groups in your class, or you'd rather split it up into a number of students, you can do that too. Okay. Require group members to be in the same section. That's a good idea if you have separate sections. This way, someone from section one can sign up to someone in section two. Um, or you just say, I'll create the groups later. And you can do that again under the people tab. And groups, you can do this for, for discussions. So if you only want that 
group to be able to see that discussion. You could do it and you could do it for assignments too. So you can have a group assignments as well. And here it's just the available from until when you want the discussion posted. So if you hit save, right, here's the discussion topic. It sets it up so students can reply. And if you wanted to put this under your modules, you can. The other thing, I know I'm out of time here, but the other thing I just wanted to go over is announcements. So you may want to post an announcement to your class. You click on the announcements link. Now announcements cannot be posted to your modules. Okay, they're very similar to discussions, right? So if you want to put an announcement here, okay, um, you can type that in and post it to all sections, just like a discussion. You can choose a file if you want to attach a file. The only difference is because it's not a threaded discussion, there's really not as many options. You can delay the posting. So if you want to post it on the first day of class, for instance, you just put in that date. You can make it a podcast feed like you can with a discussion board, and you can also allow liking. Now, the only thing to remember with announcements is if you want them to see the announcement, you will want to show the link on the left hand side. Um, there are settings in your account. Okay. And if you want, I mean, I know IT goes over all of this stuff, but if you go to your account settings, okay, and there is. Okay, if you go to notifications, there is a switch here to turn on announcements. Now, I think by default, they're already on. This basically means that you're gonna get an announcement in your email, your students will too. So even if you don't wanna show the announcements on your Canvas, but you still want the student to get the announcement, um, they should be able to get it by default. I think the announcement will always be on. So as long as they're registered with the, in the class and they have their email all set up, which I think they will automatically, they will get that announcement. Um, okay. Oh, let me go to my dashboard. It's easier to see. Okay, so that's announcements. And oh, another thing I'd like to show is the syllabus. This is really quick. They do give you a syllabus link on the left hand side. You can hide it if you want. I'm probably going to hide mine just because I have a link to my syllabus in my welcome screen. But you can, this is nice because you actually don't have to do anything and they will set up your syllabus to show you all the assignments and when they're due. So every time you create an assignment and um, in your course or you create a quiz, it will show up on the syllabus that they create for you. Also, remember the assignment groups that we made with all the different weights? That shows up too automatically. So that's a really nice feature. And then if you wanna put anything else in the syllabus that Canvas gives you, you do have to edit it because it becomes a rich content editor. So um, the only thing that they'll set up is the course summary with the assignments and the group weights. And then anything else you wanna put in, you just put in the rich text editor and it will, you can put your whole syllabus there if you wanted to. Um, have you graded writing papers? Yep, how did that go? Yeah, that I, I, I have. Um, and well, let me think, yeah. Well, let me think about that. I'm trying to remember. Actually, I haven't. I've done it in Blackboard, but if you used Blackboard, uh, Michelle, it's very similar. So um, let's see. I have an assignment here, but the assignment was not a paper assignment, but I can change it really quick to show you. Let me edit. Oops, I do have to click on it to edit it. So I'm going to make this assignment a file upload. Okay. And I'm going to save it. Okay. I'm going to enter the student view. Oh, I do have to publish it.
So let me go to the assignment. I mean, they have an annotation tool, right? Similar to Blackboard. Okay. And now let me go back to my modules, student view. <laughs> And here it is. Okay, so now what they would do is drag their paper here. And I'll go ahead and um, I'll bring in my, um, I'll just bring in my Canvas workshop assignment here. Okay. Uploads it. Oh, I didn't submit it. What did I just do? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I just clicked on the next assignment. I'm sorry. Let me go through that one more time. Here we go. Okay. Oh, it's there still. Okay, submit the assignment. Okay, so now I'm going to leave the student view. I'm going to go to my grade book. Here's my assignment here. And you just go to the grading, the speed grader, the same as you would for a quiz. And here it is. Okay. And then what you can do is put in your uh, annotations. So this is a free text annotation. So this is how I would usually do it in Blackboard. Maybe I'd write it in red. And I put a little comment here. This is my comment. You know, maybe I'll show how much I'm taking off for that particular uh, um, thing. And then you just go ahead and, oh, I made this an incomplete completed, but if I made it points, you can go ahead and just put in your points and you can also add your comments here. And then you submit it and then it gets graded. So. Okay, so Michelle, hopefully that, uh, okay, graded a few easier in Blackboard. Yep, so hopefully that helped Michelle. That's how I used it in Blackboard and it's how I would use it here as well. And this works by the way, even though I uploaded a Word document, if you uploaded a PDF, you could do the same thing with the PDF. So, okay. Um, oh, okay. So the only other thing I was going to show was the group. So I created a group on the fly when I did the discussion, but, or I showed how to create a group, but if you wanted to just create the groups first, you'd have to do this through the people link, and then you'd have to create a group set. And as you can see here, it's the same thing as I did in the through the discussion. So this is where you would create your student groups. So if I want to call it group one and just say I'll create groups later and hit save, then what you can do is, okay, so this is the group set. Okay, I'm sorry. So I would want to actually change this a little bit. Um, I would want to call this like assignment. So this would be your group set. So I would call it maybe assignment one groups. Okay, save that. And then within your group set, then you would set up your group. So I would have a group one, save. And then what you can do is click and drag students into the group, right? Or you can have them Right, if you wanted to have them, um, let's see, I'm sorry, you'd have to edit the group set. Assign themselves, you just say allow self sign up. Okay, and then they would assign themselves to the group. Um, and that's it, and then you can use these groups for whatever you want. So if you have a particular group set for assigning one group, <laughs> that's the one you would use. So let's say I did create if I was in assignments and I did say, you know what, I'd like to make this a group assignment.
and you come down here and say, um, make this a group. Oops, students have already, so, oh, I've already submitted. Okay, so what I'm gonna do then is, I'm gonna reset the student. Okay, so I reset and now go back into assignments, edit this. Well, still won't let me do it. Okay. All right. So even though I reset the student, still thinks I submitted it. But if I was able to click this, then it would show me that group one, uh, group assignment one group, and I could select that. And then it would basically make that group for that assignment and, and, and apply it to this particular assignment. So that's how you would do groups. And again, that's in people. Okay, I'm actually gonna delete it because I'm not gonna use that. And that's pretty much it. The only, only other thing, and I won't spend too much time on is Zoom. This is another thing that Canvas does better than Blackboard. Blackboard, um, we had, I'm trying to remember, you had to set up the Zoom first, like almost like load it in as an app before you can use it. Um, where in Canvas, it's already here. So you should have a Zoom meeting link automatically on the left, whether you use it or not, it's there. So if you're teaching an online class or, you know, who knows what's gonna happen in the fall? You know, maybe, you know, uh, the infection rate may be high, they'll say, you know what, we're gonna move again on uh, online, okay? And you say, okay, well, now I gotta use Zoom. It's already here. And all you need to do is just schedule a new meeting. And what's really nice is because it's integrated into Canvas, you can make it, I think by default, the student has to be registered in the class to use it. A lot of instructors I found that I spoke to didn't know that this was a feature in Blackboard. And what they would do is they would actually give their personal identification code to students and say, here's the code you'd have to use to join my Zoom class, which is okay, but anyone can then use that code to join the Zoom class. And you'd have what's called Zoom bombings. When it's integrated into the course, um, you don't have to worry about that because students have to log into Canvas to go into your Zoom meeting. Okay, so you just say schedule a new meeting. And if you wanted to, um, you can do, you know, you can do a different topic each day. That's usually what I do, even though it takes longer and I have to go in and schedule a new meeting each day. Um, you can do that. So I always did like chapter one, lecture one, chapter two, lecture two. The reason I did that is because if a student missed a class, it was much easier to go in to see which material they missed. But if you wanted to, you can also just make it a recurring meeting. So for instance, this is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. So in my Zoom meeting, I can say, okay, I want Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm gonna repeat this every week. And then you can do an end date, right? When is this gonna end? Um, I think you could do a start date too. I thought you could. Um, Oh yeah, th this is the start date up here. So you could say, okay, my class starts on, um, well, I don't know why it's bringing me out so far. So my class starts on August 20th and it ends on, right? Gosh, I didn't wanna do that. Here we go, 2021. So we'll say it ends December, I think December 10th is the last day. Okay, passcode you don't even need because again, they have to go through Canvas to get to it, right? Waiting room, only authentication, authenticated users can join meetings. Well, again, this is, they'll only be able to join it if they're in the Canvas anyway. So you don't have to click on this. Um, but if you did, that would just mean they have to sign in to Zoom to, to access it. But I would just leave that unchecked. Video, you want the host for the video on or participants on or off. Audio, I always like to do computer audio only. Otherwise, if you make it by telephone, they'll call in when they're in the car. 
um, you know, just to join the class. So I always make a computer audio to make sure that although they can, if you even computer audio, they can do from the cell phone. Um, and then there's some other media. Enable a join before the host if you want them to join before you do. Mute them upon entry. Record the meeting automatically. I like this a lot. And then do in the cloud. So this way, as soon as you start it, you don't have to remember to hit record. It will automatically record. In the cloud just means it's going to be accessible from, from um, the tab within Zoom. So I highly recommend using this rather than on the local computer. And then you hit save. Okay, and if you go back to your course meetings, here's every class because it's recurring that they could come and click on. Okay, if you do record in the cloud, all they have to do is go to cloud recordings and they'll see it here. So if they miss a class, they click on that tab and they can access the recording. Okay, I'm actually going to delete it because I'm not going to use Zoom for this class. Um, but that's it. And that's how you can use uh, Zoom meetings for your classes. So that's everything. I know I'm 15 minutes over, but that's everything that I really use for my classes. Again, a lot more features that maybe you'll find useful. Um, but I know IT does, OLET has um, several times a week. Um, these trainings that they do. So if you haven't attended those, I encourage you to, to attend their trainings. I think they send an email out about it. Um, and, and I've gone to them and um, they're pretty small. Uh, they'll probably get a little bit bigger as we get closer to the beginning of the semester. Um, but they're pretty small and personal and, and um, you'll learn a lot in that as well in, in, in that, uh, that those training sessions that they have. But uh, I hope that I was able to provide at least enough for you to, you know, start up your classes for the fall and start using Canvas. And uh, yeah, you're welcome. As you can see, it's, it, it's really, in my opinion, a lot easier to use in Blackboard. Um, Blackboard has a lot of features, but so much so that can be overwhelming. Canvas really simplifies a lot of these things. And um, in my opinion, I can, in my courses, at least I was able to create them a lot faster in Canvas than I was in Blackboard. And uh, things are a lot more straightforward. So hopefully you enjoy Canvas and using it. And by the way, if you have any other questions after this session, you can reach out to me um, and I'll be happy to uh, set up uh, an individual meeting if you'd like. And also, I'd like to point you to the Brown Center blog. Okay, I'll, I'll send this link here. Under the remote and digital learning dropdown, under resources, um, we're, we're doing, um, we have Canvas faculty partners and uh, Nancy, Barbara, and Petro Xanthopoulos um, um, volunteered to be a faculty partner. So IT is great, you know, if you want to reach out to IT, they can help you with these systems. But if you like more, more of an instructor's perspective uh, for instructors that have used it, uh, like I have, you can reach out to one of us and we can schedule meetings with you individually and help you set up your courses. Um, if you feel you know Canvas pretty well, if you'd like to be a faculty partner, you know, you can reach out to me. I'd be happy to add you to the list. Um, we do provide a lunch, um, so if, if you know, if we'll, we'll pay for a lunch. That's uh, kind of our repayment to you for doing this. Um, uh, but uh, but I would appreciate that, and we can add you to the list. Or you know, if you need help and want to reach out to one of us, you can. All right. So that's it. Um, we'll also send you a survey if you if you can fill out the survey. It'll be a Windows uh, uh, form survey. Um, so it'll be a link that you'll go to and, and just fill it out online. And Chris will send that out sometime today. All right, so thanks for attending. And um, if you want to repeat, I'm going to do it again in um, not next week, but the week after. So August 9th, 10th and 11th, I'm going to do the same set of sessions that I did this week. So feel free to attend those as well. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.